What I'm about to show you will have the torches and pitchforks aimed at me with calls for my cancellation. For the last hundred years, vitamin D has been a very controversial topic because I believe it helps so many people in so many ways. And then what happened? We're told to stay out of the sun. Here, take your sunblock. Vitamin D can be toxic. Big Pharma, Modern Medicine, want you to take extremely low doses of vitamin D. So has clinical medicine been tricked by Big Pharma? Should we be taking vitamin D at a dose of 10,000 international units, like what Dr. Berg recommends? Or should we follow the Endocrine Society's new guideline that has substantial changes, but still has a vastly different recommendation to Dr. Berg? We have to get this right. Vitamin D is associated with reduced heart disease, cancer, autoimmune diseases, and improved muscle strength, metabolism, and even our immune responses to infections. So how do we navigate this vitamin D minefield of conflicting recommendations. I'll break it down. First, when we observe the population, low vitamin D levels have consistently been linked with poor health. That led to an explosion in popularity of vitamin D supplements and vitamin D blood tests. Back in 1999, only about 0.3% of the US population took vitamin D supplements. Fast forward to 2013, and that number skyrocketed to 18.2%, and it's even higher now. But here's the problem. The studies that show that people with higher vitamin D levels are healthier also show us the pitfalls of observational studies. They're prone to bias. For example, older adults who live in rest homes spend the majority of their time inside and will have a low vitamin D level. On the other hand, healthier older adults who don't need to be in a rest home spend more time outside and their vitamin D levels will be higher. It's a classic chicken and egg debate. It's like saying everyone who carries an umbrella causes rain. No, they're carrying umbrellas because it's already raining. So are some people healthier because they spend more time outside, have higher vitamin D levels and therefore suffer less disease? Or has vitamin D actually got nothing to do with it? In this scenario, an older person with great vitamin D levels becomes sick, needs to move into a rest home, spends more time indoors and their vitamin D levels go down. In this case, low vitamin D levels correlate with poor health, but they don't cause poor health. So which one is it? And again, we have to get this right because the associate between vitamin D and health are too strong to ignore. Over the past few decades, vitamin D has been marketed as a sort of panacea. Do you need stronger bones? Take vitamin D. Want to fend off colds? Vitamin D. Worried about heart disease, cancer or even depression? Yep, take vitamin D. It's become the vitamin that could do no wrong. So who should be taking vitamin D? Let's start with the four groups that both the pro-supplement crowd and the more conservative voices agree. Vitamin D supplementation is a no-brainer for preventing rickets. So kids up to 18 years should be getting about one and a half thousand international daily units, not just to prevent rickets, but also potentially to lower the risk of respiratory infections. Rickets might seem like a disease from the past, something we associate with Victoria-era London, but it's very much a concern, especially in areas where kids don't receive enough sunlight or have diets low in vitamin D. The evidence is strong here. Supplementing with vitamin D can help prevent these skeletal issues that lead to pain, deformity, and delayed growth. And when it comes to respiratory infections, vitamin D is thought to play a critical role in our immune response. Some studies suggest that kids who get enough vitamin D might be less likely to catch the common cold or even more serious respiratory infections. So supplementing here isn't just about bones, it's about overall health. The second group is an extremely important one. Supplementation during pregnancy can lower the risk of preeclampsia, preterm birth, and even improve newborn health. We're talking doses around 3,000 international units every day. Pregnancy is a time where the body is under extra stress and ensuring enough vitamin D can help with a variety of issues. For example, preeclampsia, which is a condition that causes high blood pressure and can lead to serious complications for both mother and baby, has been linked to low vitamin D levels. By supplementing, we can potentially reduce the risk of these types of complications. The third group is those at high risk of progressing to diabetes. Vitamin D can play a role. Studies suggest that an average dose of about 3,500 international National units a day can help. Prediabetes is a condition where blood sugar levels are starting to creep up, but they're not high enough yet to be classified as diabetic. For people in this group, lifestyle changes are absolutely critical, but adding vitamin D supplementation might give extra help in delaying or preventing the progression to full-blown diabetes. 
and the fourth group is adults 75 years and older. As we age, the risk of death obviously increases, and it seems that vitamin D supplements appear to decrease this risk. So why does age matter so much? Well, as we get older, our skin becomes less efficient at producing vitamin D from sunlight, and our kidneys, which also play a role in converting vitamin D to its active form, also start to slow down. It's why the guidelines specifically call out older adults as a group that benefits from regular vitamin D supplementation. It's about helping to maintain bone health, muscle function, and overall resilience as we age. That's the easy part, where everyone agrees that vitamin D supplements offer health benefits to those groups of people. But here's where the controversy gets tricky, and where the torches and pitchforks might be aimed in my direction. For these four groups of people, where everyone agrees that supplementation is a good idea, why don't we take the guesswork out of it and measure the vitamin D blood levels? That way we can individualize the vitamin D dose and achieve the perfect level. It sounds simple and elegant. Why then do the new Endocrine Society guidelines recommend against vitamin D blood tests during pregnancy? It sounds bizarre, doesn't it? Why on earth would a guideline be written like this and risk the health of unborn babies? Well, here's where we need to add nuance to the topic and cue the pitchforks. From the evidence we have at the moment, we don't know what the optimal vitamin D blood level is. And it's okay to say that we don't know something, rather than making blanket statements, which is unfortunately what many health influencers do. In the preterm birth studies, the average doses used were just over 3,000 international units. At that dosage, pregnant women are going to have reasonable vitamin D levels. They are not going to be deficient. At the moment, there's no good evidence that aiming for higher vitamin D levels is going to offer any further benefits to either the babies or the mother. The clinical guidelines are written in such a way that they're only going to recommend something if there's strong evidence of benefit. There's an engineering idea that may help to explain this concept. The best part is no part. The best process is no process. A key downfall of talented engineering teams is to optimize something that shouldn't exist. And it's the same idea here for vitamin D blood levels. Given that we don't know what the best vitamin D level is, and again it's okay to say that we don't know something, why should any vitamin D guideline suggest to aim for a specific level that is not evidence-based? Instead, the guideline suggests that we can cut out vitamin D testing because we know that during pregnancy, if we supplement with around 3,000 international units, we're not going to be deficient and we're going to lock in all of the known benefits. We can cut out the costs of vitamin D tests and cut out the worry about chasing a certain vitamin D level that has got no known benefits. Again, the best process is no process. It's important to understand that these guidelines aren't about limiting people unnecessarily. They're about preventing us from chasing numbers that don't necessarily translate to better health outcomes. The endocrine society is saying, let's focus on what we know works rather than over medicating just because we can. But that leads us on to the next question. Why are the guidelines so conservative? Why not just take more if it seems to do us good? And this is where the understanding of the difference between correlation and causation is crucial. Just because people with higher vitamin D levels seem healthier doesn't mean that more vitamin D is the key to good health. It's like saying everyone who drives a luxury car is wealthy. Sure, there's a connection, but buying a luxury car won't make you rich. And there's another critical point here safety. There's a reason why we don't take high doses of every vitamin. Too much vitamin D can lead to issues like hypercalcemia, where your calcium levels go too high, causing confusion, weakness, and even kidney problems. The guidelines are designed to protect against these risks of over-treatment and to promote practices that are based on solid evidence. So what about for otherwise healthy adults? I've already mentioned that the guideline recommends vitamin D supplementation for adults 75 years and older, but what about for younger adults? What's the best dose for them? The previous Endocrine Society guideline in 2011 recommended 1,500 to 2,000 international units daily, but that recommendation has changed. And to find find out why, we need to look at the data. The largest vitamin D trial is called the VITAL trial, and it involved just under 26,000 participants who were followed up for five years. Now, there is a problem with the study, which we'll come to shortly. Some people were in the vitamin D group, and they took 2,000 international units. Others were in the placebo group, and after five years, the vitamin D group did not have lower rates of cancer, cardiovascular disease, or death. 
Here's the problem though. The placebo group could take up to 800 international units of vitamin D. So very few people in this trial had low vitamin D levels, and that likely explains why there were no benefits seen. What this suggests is that so long as we're not deficient in vitamin D, higher doses don't seem to offer any additional benefits in otherwise healthy people. It's like topping up your gas tank. Once it's full, adding more doesn't get you further, it just spills over and causes a mess. For those under 75 who are otherwise healthy, the guidelines recommend following the recommended daily intake, which is 600 international units for younger adults, increasing to 800 international units as you hit 50 years and above. That dose is less than the previous Endocrine Society guideline, and I want to emphasize this point. After a further 13 years of data collection and human trials, the Endocrine Society is recommending less vitamin D compared to their previous guideline, and I'm going to talk about funding soon. All of this is very different from what you'll hear from health influencers who promote supplementing with much higher doses, and I feel the torch is being aimed my way, but here's the reality. The 600 to 800 international unit dose for the general population makes sure that people aren't deficient in vitamin D and locks in the known benefits. And similar to our previous discussion about vitamin D tests in pregnancy, the guideline here also recommends against routine blood tests for otherwise healthy individuals. And and I can hear the thoughts going off in your mind. Why not just test everyone and individualize the dose? Think of vitamin D testing like trying to bake the perfect cake without knowing the exact temperature you need to set in the oven. We don't have enough evidence to say this is the perfect vitamin D level you should have in your blood. And without that critical piece of information, testing everyone and aiming for a specific level is a waste of resources, time, and can cause unnecessary worry. The best process is no process. From trials such as the VITAL trial, there's no good evidence that there are any benefits from higher doses in otherwise healthy people. And it's because of this updated guideline that I've elected to reduce the dose of vitamin D in microvitamin from 2,000 to 1,000 international units for formula version 6. Another criticism aimed at these guidelines is that they focus solely on vitamin D and don't factor in the effects of supplementing with other molecules such as vitamin K2 and magnesium. However, just like vitamin D, it appears that reaching the recommended daily intakes offers all of the benefits and there's no evidence that mega dosing offers any further benefits. This includes high doses of vitamin K2 and magnesium. The take home message, there are absolutely indications to supplement with higher doses than the standard 600 to 800 international units. For example, if you're in one of those high risk groups that we talked about earlier, then a higher dose may be warranted. But for the general population, if we use 600 to 800 international units, we lock in all of the known benefits. We can delete the process of vitamin D blood tests because there's no evidence that targeting a particular level, so long as we're reaching the recommended daily intake vitamin D offers any additional benefits. And I think it's a real shame that there are influencers out there who go against these endocrine guidelines and sell high dose vitamin D supplements. It's a glaring conflict of interest that doesn't get called out enough. And when you think about it, do you want to follow the recommendations from someone who's trying to sell you high dose vitamin D supplements or the recommendations from the world's best endocrinologists who look at all of the data, draw from their clinical experience and together create these guidelines? Which leads us into talking about funding. Who funded the Endocrine Society guideline? Was it Big Pharma? Well, funding for the development of this guideline was provided by the Endocrine Society itself. No other entity provided financial support, and there is complete independence between funding and the development of the Endocrine Society programs. Whenever I've done previous videos like this, where I contrast what health influencers promote and the clinical guidelines recommend, the comment section erupts and there are calls to cancel me. But you know what? It's water off a duck's back. I am here to do what's right by you. And speaking of vitamin K2, which is also a controversial topic, if you want to know why I take vitamin K2, make sure to check out this next video here. And a massive thank you to all of the Patreons supporting the channel.